Hello guys, my name is Mark from jazzguitarlessons.net. Improve your jazz guitar playing with a real teacher, that's me. And welcome to this quick vlog on uh, playing ballads actually, which is a, a topic I had, I should have covered uh, a while ago. So in this quick, um, I wouldn't say unprepared, I'm, I'm ready, but this is not a scripted video. I just want to talk about why it's important to play ballads as part of your standards repertoire of building songs. And also, uh, you know, what's the What's the purpose of playing ballads in history and etc. So let's get going right right away. So the the reason behind this video is uh, typically younger guys. I would say probably like me or younger. We we tend to think that ballads are a good place to to show off, right? You can just show your chops and play really fast because the tempo is slow, so you have more time on each chord. So you think you can just blow and and play like amazing lines and chops. And actually, I read a book by uh, Jerry Coker. It's right here called the jazz ballad uh, i'm not affiliated this is on advanced music and it even comes with a compact disc can you believe that and uh, it's a great book just for for the examples that he put on because uh i don't recall which standard he picked but there's a, a version where he literally blows all his chops within like you know eight measures and as as a kid i would listen to this and go oh that's you know what that's pretty cool but according to the author jerry says well this is anti-cool because you could express way more things than just fast lines if you learn how to express yourself on a ballad. Hence, you know, this, this quick vlog where I want to I wanna share that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard topic, I have to admit, and there's been a phase in my own learning of jazz where I remember I played nothing but ballads for six months because I went, you know, I want to play I Fall in Love Too Easily and Dardan Dream and all these cheesy really cheesy tunes and not <laughs> you know i would always start soloing and be really inspired and just run out of gas after i don't know eight bars or 16 bars i'd go like oh now that i played everything i know i'm starting to repeat myself so that's why i in, in an effort to, to cover for this i uh, i wanted to you know make a, a vlog for those of you who might think this is helpful uh, uh as always thanks for watching i'm glad you're here and let's do this and it's been a while it's been a long while since I, I shot uh, videos to put on the website, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, we're picking Body and Soul. The standard Body and Soul by, I guess it was uh, written by uh, John Green is the music, and there's a few lyricists, a famous song. And what we're doing here, I, I'm going to try to show you four steps to... Uh, if you haven't, you, you should watch a little Miss Sunshine. 12 steps only. So every time I, I do videos with steps, I'm like, ah. But uh, seriously, there's four steps you can apply to make this thing go smoother. And step one is we're going to talk about body and soul. So you should get a good recording, uh, which I won't play now because I'm going to be harassed by YouTube for you know, copyright issues and stuff like that. Um, famous version that put that song on the map in the world of jazz is Col Coleman ha Hawkins. Coleman ha Hawkins, a tenor sax player, famous guy in the, say just early on the bebop and, the, you know, before that even in the swing. And uh, for me, my favorite version of all time is uh, the Dexter Gordon body and soul version, really intricate and interesting. And if you're a fan of this, there's Tony Bennett and Amy Winehouse that uh, before she passed they recorded that together so it's a great tune to you know know the lyrics to and as you work with ballads you don't have to use body and soul but you should be so attuned to to the song's message and, and what it what it really means like the lyrics play a more important role here than your standards that you will play like half tempo you know mid tempo and fast tempos now it's like it's more about like that, ugh, that feeling, you know, of what it really means to, to play those notes over chord changes. So number one, that's step one. Step one is to be playing, uh, to be hearing the song in your ears, to be familiar. Don't make it. Please do not do that. I keep reminding my students, don't have this be just a piece of paper in your fake book that you kind of don't relate to and then people say oh jazz is boring well it's not boring if you listen to the right <laughs> the right stuff on recordings right so put the song in your ears as much as possible step two step two i don't know why I i'm funny tonight uh step two is playing the melody as is uh plain and also just uh, as my colleague justin said just play it in the air 
Uh, you would say if you're a singer, you would play it somewhat like a, a cappella, right? That, that would be the way. So let me just demonstrate quickly that step two. Just ensure that your rendition of the melody is in a good spot on the fretboard, that you can play it from memory, and that you know it in and out, like uh, the same way you would know Happy Birthday or Mary Had a Little Lamb or whatever. You ready? So let me just do this out of time. So I'm not gonna put you guys to sleep. Oh, that's another one thing. If you wanna put people to sleep at a jam session, that's what you do, call a ballad. People are like, I don't wanna play a ballad. However, see who sticks around to play a ballad with you at jam sessions. That, that shows a lot and a lot of beautiful things have happened uh, while I was at jam sessions and being the smart ass that calls ballad, that was me. So I just played you the first eight bars of that song. I'm pointing at the screen because I got a reliable lead sheet, not affiliated. Uh, affiliated Chuck Sher, Sher Publishing, S-H-E-R. They have the New Real Book, New Real Book Volume 1, 2, and 3. They're the best, most accurate lead sheets you can find, and they're legal. They're not like photocopies of photocopies, so get it. So I got this on my screen now just as a reference. Uh, there are several versions of the song, several ways people have altered the uh, changes. Coltrane did, uh, Dexter Gordon did, a lot of people did. So ensure you can do that, and even at the B section, right? So that's that's really step two. So step one is getting the tune in your ear. Step two is to be able to play it just like this. Now I started to do a little bit of step three and that's if you get so bored of playing the melody plain in and of itself, you can start to add little devices. Um, saxophones, they can bend the note. Um, they can bend it down actually. As guitars, we can bend it up. <laughs> Nylon strings, not the best. Thing to, to do bending, right? Uh, we can slide in, right? See here, I just did the C note and another C note on the next string, so that's totally a Jim Hall, not yet, I stole from Jim Hall. So there's that note. So we can do it with any tone of fretboard if you'd like, but say you pick that C note. You have that same C note, so you can go and it just adds texture. So any mean you can find to add a little bit of texture around the melody is yours to grab. So that's step three, is to make the melody, I would say, interesting by the means of these musical devices that you have that are accessible to you. For me, uh, sometimes I'd play something like I play these minimal, you know, third and seventh voicing that that go down. It's like, oh, all of a sudden, I, I sort of, I sort of filled in the space. I did not like go berserk on the melody with tremolos and hammer-ons and pull-offs, but at least I I was able to make the melody a little bit more interesting. And it's like, details matter. Details, the devil's in the details. So it's a, it's always these tiny things. So that's my step three. Looking at my sheet, by the way, that's still my invaluable little red journal. I'm about to switch a black journal because this one's going to be full soon. And number three, uh, number three is uh, ornamenting, uh, ornamenting or adding devices and whatever, and make it make it sound good. And even without starting to improvise, are you are you able to take that challenge? You know, step number one is it's a pretty easy challenge. You know, listen to the tune until you can sing it. Step two is pretty easy too. It's like play the melody just in the air, boring, and make sure you you got it down. Fine. 
Number three is, do you accept the challenge of making it sound good, even if you're not starting to play lines and improvise and play blues lines around it? Are you able to do that? So that's a challenge. And then finally, in step four, we go and we'll try to improvise around the melody. And that's where here I want to take a little bit of time to uh, actually start my backing track and show you how it could sound like to, sorry, improvise around the melody to body and soul and not, uh, not ornament too much. I will put that uh, tempo as, at 60 BPM and I'm going to go once through the form. So the form is AABA. It's pretty obvious, pretty easy. So each run of eight bars, I'm going to go deeper in the improv and less deep in the, the melody itself. So you have to be able to actually step four is a recurring step that you will do over and over again. So you do one course, you're like, okay, I'm just going to play the around the melody. And the further you get into it, you play less and less of the melody and more and more of what you would want to play if you were <laughs> just blowing your ass off. All right, so let me start this and uh, wish me luck. This is a real pro playing. Three, four. bridge. myself I would have continued for a little while so as you were seeing um, you know this is spur of the moment no safety net I, I I didn't you know like record this and edit it and try to do something else I'm just trying to uh, have this point show across that you can really really be sticking to the melody in your head and go yeah you know I choose not to play that melody note or that rhythm but I'm still on it. I'm still thinking of the melody. I'm still expressing things that relate back to the melody. And I really insist on this. I, I'm a little French Canadian dude here near Ottawa and I'm not pretending to be of a legendary stature when it comes to exemplifying this stuff. Actually, you know, listen to Dexter Gordon and these guys, they really, they really uh, blazed the path for us. They really like, they were trailblazers. So um, that's all I have for step four. And what I wanted to do as well, so there's, um, there's two more things regarding, you know, playing more of the melody and then being on the melody to such a point that you don't even need to play it anymore and people still know what you're playing. And not just because you're spelling the changes right, but also because of the depth of your ideas. I want to point you to a famous, uh, maybe not so famous, but famous piano player and bass player, Keith, Keith Jarrett and Charlie Hayden. They recorded two albums together, so bass and piano. 
and they do play Body and Soul, and they do play Round Midnight, and they do play like a few of these really old standards, like uh, No Moon at All, and um, One Day I'll Fly Away, and things like that. <laughs> it's so corny, but at the same time, when they start, I remember they start on Round Midnight, he doesn't even play the head, he doesn't play the melody, he just starts soloing, but then at what point, you know, the where, the line is blurry, where's soloing and where's melody, so that's that's that territory I think I was seeking in my own example and that I think you should be seeking for because Keith Jarrett sitting at a piano, he doesn't need to go bo ba da ti da bo ba ba do da ti da to know that he's playing round midnight. He's just playing round midnight. He's doing his own thing. And that's uh, that was a really, really uh, inspiring album because then you could say, well, how short is he of just spelling the changes? And I think that becomes the equivalent of you know sculpting like a sculpture it's like the block of marble is there and then the statue already lives in it it's like you just have to carve out what you don't want to see for the change running side that's i think that's the approach like it's not you have to think in removing what you would regularly regularly play to outline the changes if that makes sense so uh, i know I, i'm like i'm getting a little bit esoteric uh, but that that was my my four step approach. For those of you who want to stick at, uh, stick around, I have two or three more things I want to discuss. So just to recap, step one: really hear the melody. Step two: really state the melody clearly. Step three: see if you can state the melody with different devices to make it interesting. And step four: see if you can improvise around the melody before you start to really blow uh, like any old tune you would you know, just play on the changes, think of theme and variation, play the melody, play off of the melody. Now, step five, um, you know, if you want to play meaningful lines, like I said, that derive from the melody, it means meaningful means you must hear it pretty well, right? And for me, and you've heard this in countless videos, I can't help myself, uh, I sing a lot of the lines I play. And that would be my bonus challenge, almost like my step five, see if you can avoid just blowing on the changes by singing what you're playing or playing what you sing. Or if I, 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 sometimes I don't know, it's like, is it uh, the dog that's walking the owner or vice versa? Sometimes I, I really don't know. So I'm going to demonstrate this right now with the same, uh, with the same track. I'm just going to make the tempo a tiny bit faster to uh, so we save some time in the video because we're already what 20 minutes in um, and I'm gonna try and sing uh, let me actually start at the B section and uh, I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna start at the B until the end and just I'm gonna sing just sing at the same time as I'm uh, as I'm soloing see if you can take this as a challenge a take home like oh are you able to do this and does this mean your your lines are significantly anchored in in what you're saying or is this just you're blowing smoke and you're letting your your fingers play all right so i'm going to start that four bars no bar five actually just to give us a little context and give me time to drop my pick Second time. Oh well. So that's the second A, A section. Sorry, I, that's a magic of live, right? Oh, 
something like that. So you see that there are moments where I'm uh, I'm not I don't know if I'm singing when I'm playing, playing when I'm singing. There are moments where clearly uh, and you know totally like no shame. I'm totally not doing what I'm supposed to do, what I'm trying to teach you, which is you should play inspired lines. Aim to play inspired lines like 50% of the time and the other 50 like, eh, I can always fill it with <laughs> by arpeggios or whatever I know about the song, right? So that's the, let's put it like this, that's the honest jazz guitarist advice. It's like you will sometimes be super into it only to go like, oh wait, <laughs> you know, did I miss a bar? Did I miss something? That's totally normal. Uh, take it like meditation. So uh, that's my bonus challenge. That's that's my step five for you. Now there's two more things. Uh, one thing I get for desserts, like of course, if you're playing ballads, you're a jazz guitarist, what you will want to do is create a chord melody. You have all the time in the world. You have everything you need. You have the chord changes passing slowly. You have the band's going to listen to you. You have time to place your fingers. Just don't make your chord melody too complicated as I've done so many times uh, because if you build a chord melody for yourself and you're not even able to perform it, then what's the use, right? Uh, and very last point, this sort of practice has to be done, less is more, but I've done it with the backing track to give you an idea because doing this just by myself, no background, it would have been really hard to hear the context. So what you can do, you can do this with backing tracks, you can do this with the recording, you can use the uh, Coleman Hawkins recording and put it on and just play with it see what comes out you can do this with the metronome the metronome in several different settings I've put put out some podcasts and videos about metronome practice or you can do this alone on your own just alone the, this it takes balls to do this honestly just remember that less is more so if you're able uh, I'm gonna de demonstrate here use iReal Pro and actually uh, you can remove the piano just play just with the bass and the drums check this out Three, four. My heart is sad and lonely. That's pretty cool. And then if you're brave, you can even remove the drums and just play with just the bass. Or remove the bass and play with drums and piano. Or, you know, see if you can hold it together without someone always spoon feeding you the changes in the time. That's really the essence of it. And that's how I said when I had my standards ballad phase, I would just literally put the metronome at, I don't know, 50 in front of me and play for hours on, I love Body and Soul, Body and Soul, but I love, uh, I fall in love too easily. You know, the Chad Baker version. I love Darn, Darn That Dream. I'm a fool to want you. That's another good one. Blue and green, of course, goes without saying. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's a good thing to play less is more because then you're just accountable for more of what's going on. All right, on that note, I think that's enough, right? That's a, that's a quick vlog, it's like over 20 minutes. And once again, my name is Mark from jazzguitarlessons.net. Improve your jazz guitar playing with a real teacher me and i uh, can see you soon on the website itself jazzguitarlessons.net please subscribe to this channel here and share it with anyone who you think might like it on social media or by email and i will see you soon on the next video take care